show they have for people who watch the volume here. Starfish is a place where everybody should be. As one of the poems I wrote said, um, it is a place to be. There are many places to rise and shine, but a few places to be a sunshine. And I think um, for everyone, Starfish is a place that can make you feel like a sunshine. Um, simply because I think coming in, for example, as a volunteer, um, Starfish gives you the ability um, or the opportunity, I would say, to be able to follow your passion, to be able to put it into practical terms and to be able to use it to help others. Because when you come here to work with us, we don't just look at what you're qualified in or um, the profession you are in. We try to look at what you're passionate about. So let's say if you were a doctor, but you're passionate about sports, then you come to Starfish, we look at the needs of the girls um, at that particular moment, how do they need sport to um, can reach their lives and then we try to put a program that you can follow to be able to at the same time follow your passion and help the girls so that is why it is the place to be because it because it helps you um you know just strengthen your passion and be able to do something with it and not just for yourself but for um you know a whole community that can benefit from it and secondly um surface experience i think widens your horizon of you know what girls can do the realities of girls especially in the developing world but at the same time, the kind of strength we have. Because out there, most people think, you know, um, the guys here are oppressed, they don't have a voice, they don't have opportunities. Yes, they don't have choices, but they are intelligent, they are beautiful, um, they are diverse, and they are accepting. So when you come here, uh, we love you unconditionally, and we try to see how best we can help you find your true self. And so I think that is an experience anybody would have, because we don't just focus on what you're going to give us, but we look at the program, we design it in such a way that you learn from our culture, you get to know the people from deep within, you, just, you don't just come to the classroom and teach, but you know people for who they are, and you learn from it, and then which is your experience um, as a human being. Each of the students are expected to do an individual service project every month and a group service project um, every time. And then the parents are also expected to do a service project. So in terms of the students, um, we want them to be able to go back into their communities, look at their needs and see what they can contribute. Because for us, we believe that um, if they've been trained from this very stage um, to be able to look at um, the needs of the society, what they can do for their community and not having to think like, oh, when I grow up someday, I'm going to be um, helping my community. But right now, um, it could be like helping keep the streets clean. It could be teaching classes. Um, it could be um, helping the old women um, do their chores. It could be anything that you know that you can do. Um, be able to um, put a smile in somebody's face. We expect the students to be able to do that. Independence is one of our greatest qualities at Starfish International. And um, we expect all our students to at least have a small business. So Starfish International provides the platform for students to start up their own small business to be able to take care of their basic needs. So when I was a student, I did photography as my small business. And I'm so proud to call myself a professional photographer. And I've made a lot of money from my photography business and I've helped my parents, I've helped myself, I've helped pay for fees at school, I've helped um, take care of my basic needs and I'm so proud because since I started doing my small business as a growing, as a growing girl, I've never um, bothered my parents in anything that I needed and I'm used to that habit. And now I still do photography and I have other side small businesses and it's really helped me a lot. I was a Starfish student for three years. Um, I graduated a year ago and I'm currently a second year medical student at the University of the Gambia. And the Virtus program is one of the components in Starfish that I really like. Um, during the Virtus program, um, which we have every Saturday, uh, we use inspirational books like Glimmeries of Hope and Walking the Straight Path that show stories of people practicing these virtues like truthfulness, sincerity, patience, 
perseverance, being courteous, um, knowing how to share, how to show love to your friends and to your neighbors, and being able to share their stories with the students. The students are able um, to connect it with their life and being able to go out and practice these virtues. So I think um, there are many programs out there that are probably helping girls and maybe just focused on helping the girls be educated and providing them opportunities. But we are looking at how can we provide, you know, an, um, a learning and service-oriented opportunity for you, but at the same time, one that can help you be a better human being. And that is why you should definitely have um, the staff experience. Mm -hmm. video thank you so much that was brilliant thank you beautiful um, thoughtful yes go ahead did you want to say something no please go ahead uh, okay so um we're going to go ahead and uh, we wanted to share that video to basically give an idea to people on um who we are and what we do in the gambia um, and as Auntie Yasin rightly introduced herself, she's the co-founder and director of the program. And we were basically beneficiaries as students. And after we graduated, we decided to come back. And I think with regards to uh, this theme that is on COVID-19 and gender, um, it's really something that is connected to the work we do because um, we've been actually existing for over 10 years now. This is actually our 11th year. But every time we really try to look at um, how the service we are providing can be meaningful and at the same time, um, you know, can be something that is needed according to the times and um, the period we are in. And so when COVID-19 came, you know, a lot of the work we were doing, we work with 100 girls and 30 boys um, every year. Um, a lot of things changed, but also we looked at various things that we could inculcate in our programs to make sure that as we were sending the students home, they were not just going back into their families and being forgotten. Um, we looked at first how to engage them in terms of their academics. Uh, we also looked at, we know that while they were home, a lot of them were going to be depending on their parents. So what business opportunities could they explore um, that could help them to be financially independent so that they can continue to have a voice in their families. We looked at how to continue helping them in their emotional and moral growth as well. And in doing that, we divided all of the 100 girls into what we call the youth power squads. And that allowed each of the girls to be attached to an individual mentor. And this individual mentor was able to talk to them every day to check on how, how they were doing health-wise, what decisions they were making about their lives, um, you know, what worries they had, and how staffish could help. Um, and also we, we offered um, an online program that centered on teaching them um, in terms of the subjects they were doing in school. So we offered classes. We actually um, worked with the Ministry of Education in the Gambia. So we got the curriculum from them and we designed lessons so that the girls would not fall behind in school during COVID. Um, another thing we actually did, which I think is also important as we were doing the work, we had two other things. One was um, including service in their work and also um, uplifting them to be able to share their own stories. And how we did this was, um, for example, with the service projects, a girl at Starfish, um, in order to be able to get a scholarship to continue your education, you have to go back into your community and do some service. And during COVID, you know, um, mobility was restricted and going out, you know, wasn't very easy for them. But what we did was challenge them to see um, what they can do. And that included what you could actually, you can set up a hand washing station in your house. Um, usually most of our girls live in extended families. So they were able to gather some of the kids in their house, um, in their neighborhoods. And we're also able to, you know, conduct classes with them. And they were able to also conduct awareness programs with COVID-19 in their extended families. So those were ways basically that we used to challenge the students into giving back into their communities, even as they were at home and feeling like um, 
they couldn't really do much. And at the same time, we thought it was important for them to tell their stories. Um, one of the things we think is important in our work at Starfish is being able to uplift the girls to tell their own stories in their own ways. Because a lot of times I think people, you know, want to take on um, the glory of what these girls are achieving and what they're doing. And at Starfish, we feel like they should be the leaders, they should be in the forefront because they are actually putting the work. And the work we are doing at Starfish, we are not doing them favors. We are basically investing in them. And so them being able to showcase that um, can be very powerful. And I also think has instilled a lot of confidence in them. And in doing that, we did magazine productions, um, we did Facebook posts, we did um, videos. Um, we brought them to the platforms to talk about their stories. And all of this was geared basically towards um, sharing their stories. So during COVID, basically, we've been very busy, even though our campus wasn't operating, uh, we continued our program and the success stories, I think, um, has been very uplifting and it is what is keeping us here doing what we are doing. Um, I'm going to pass on to our to basically talk about a little bit about her story, but also um, in terms of such as I, I am um, talking to you about the work we do and what we've been able to accomplish in COVID-19. But if you listen to our story, you would, I think, be able to get a bigger and better picture of really how we impact these girls when they come into the program. And for example, with things like early marriage and early pregnancies, how the steps we are taking around them and centering them and making sure all our programs revolve around um, them growing as a whole um, looks like in our work. Um, so I will go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, so I joined the program when I was in the 10th grade. Um, by then I was struggling with public speaking. So I came with the intention to join the program so I can um, learn about public speaking and to speak up. Um, but when I came, Starfish was not just um, a place for me to learn that. Um, I learned beyond that. So when I was in the 11th grade, doing to be um, the 12th grade, um, I had an issue at home because my parents wanted me to um, get married to my cousin. And by then I was a student. Um, and it's very hard in the community um, to say no to your parents. So my dad came and he was like, you know, that my cousin um, was, um, uh, uh, he wasn't abroad. So they wanted me to get married to him. But by then, um, if I knew it was going to be very hard for my dad, if I stand and I'm like, no, um, I don't want that. But um, it was hard for me. So I, by then I was still a student in the program. Um, my mom too was struggling because she thought, um, if I said no, people would think that because in the community, anything that God child does, um, they blame the mom. So let's say if a child um, gets pregnant, um, the mom um, gets to be blamed because they're like, okay, you did a specific to raise the child, so you do not do your part, even though we have the dad there. Um, so my mom was also like, you know, I have insisted that I had to get married to my cousin because they, she was scared about, you know, what the people are going to say and her reputation in the community. Um, but I was very grateful that I had Starfish by then in my life um, because if not, um, I think I am where I am today because of Starfish. Um, I, it was hard for me, but then my dad was, you know, because in the community, men are uh, meant to be, you know, the people to lead. Um, they're very superior in the family and whatever they say said to happen. So I came, I remember uh, when I was, we had a volunteer um, it was the poetry session, and Fadula was among the people that are very passionate about poetry. So we were writing our stories, and I wrote it down. And she called me out um, and had a personal discussion with me and asked me thoroughly um, what I would thought about it, what I wanted to do. Um, it was very hard, but then I told her that I didn't want to get mad. And she asked me, you know, what reasons. So to help me reason out why I said I didn't want to get mad, because uh, most of the time, you know, growing up, we always uh, taught to obey our parents and always um, say yes to whatever they had to say. So by then, um, what I did was I called my cousin out, um, had a conversation with him. I told him that I didn't want to get married to him. Um, so he actually sent the message to my mom, my dad because I didn't, I'm not living with my dad. Um, or it was to my aunties and they all called both my dad and my mom and they had a really um, heated conversation. So what helped me by then, um, because I, 
I'm not used to speaking up. Every time I grew up accepting everything my mom or dad said. Um, that was the first time, so it was shocking for my dad especially. So he was like, okay, this is not the child kind of person that I raised. I raise you to always obey um, the, my decisions and always go for what I decide for you. Um, that was different, so he, was, he got really mad. So I'm very close to my dad, um, so he called me and yelled at me, and he's like, you know, you're no longer my best friend because we are very close. Um, and that was very hard for me because that was immediately I graduated from high school. And then I was like, okay, if my dad um, is telling me this, what am I going to do? Um, and my mom also came, it's like, okay, you decided to do whatever you want, um, then you're on your own. Um, so I lived it with my mom for almost like six months and she was not talking to me. We live in the same house. She stopped every single thing she was doing for me. Um, so at that moment, all I had was starfish. So I leave home in the morning, get up, do everything that I had to do, leave home and come to Starfish because by then I was newly a mentor in training. I came to volunteer. Um, and when I came, you know, Starfish is the only place that, that I love because when I get home, it's not, home is not like home for me because my mom was not talking to me. So I cannot even be in a conversation and laugh because she's there um, and I respect her that much. So I, when she comes, I greet her, but at Starfish, you know, I have family, I have mentors who always check on me, um, who are always there for me, and they're always there to listen to me. So I think um, that alone helped me. And in Starfish, we have five Starfish qualities. And out of those, um, what the four, the top four actually helped me during those moments, um, because I was involved in small business. I was going to Dakar. Um, I had a um, business loan um, through Starfish International. So I was doing a business for myself. With that, I was able to buy the basic needs that I need, so I couldn't ask anything from my mom because she stopped doing all the basic things that she was doing for me. So that helped me, you know, and also the nobility quality that is um, believing in myself and having a high self esteem because I wouldn't think that I would do that for myself alone, going through that moment, saying no to my parent and being in that condition, having a parent not talking to me, but having starfish. Um, teaching me that, you know, I think believing in myself and having self-esteem um, really helped me because during those moments was when I came up with a small business and I was doing that for myself. I was buying my perfumes, paying transportation every single day coming to Starfish. Um, and also, um, I was through the Starfish, the, one of the qualities that is the quality quality, I was able to, you know, convince my dad. At that moment, he was not listening. But um, once, after months later, we had a conversation. We call, he called me and we spoke for hours and he wanted to know, you know, why deep down why I said I didn't want to get married to my cousin. And I explained to him, I told him that um, I was not ready for marriage and I don't like him. I know most of the time in the olden days, marriage are things that are arranged, but that is not what I want for myself because if, you know, marriage is like, like a lifetime. Um, it's a very big responsibility and I don't want to take on something that I really don't want to do because I don't want to inflict, you know, certain conditions to my children. Um, I want them to be very happy. So um, after having that conversation, he understood um, and I was very grateful to him because um, through, if I didn't use that quality, quality, then I wouldn't be able to do that. But that really helped me. And I think one of the other parts is knowledge because I... You know, the public speaking, all the other extracurricular activities I've been doing at staff has helped me. And also, you know, having the fashion and wanted to go for my dream um, because I wanted to do nothing. So I was like, I have to do it, I have to do it. Um, and, you know, having Auntie Asi say, you know, education is the key to success. So you definitely have to be educated, you gonna be here and then go to school because whatever happens in the future, um, you have, you are not in control. So education and definitely have to be part of your plans. So yeah, so those were some of the skills that staff was taught me and I was able to use that um, to escape early marriage. Thank you. You know, as I was talking about all of this, I think it just hit me that, um, and this was like, I don't know, six, seven years ago, um, everything you've accomplished, she's actually in nursing school now. So maybe you should talk a little bit about um, some of the accomplishments you've been able to have since you made that decision and was able to escape early marriage? Um, so after I escaped that, um, 
I was able to, so I always wanted to do nursing. Um, it's been my great, um, you know, goal and dream that I always want to do. But um, like I said, Starfish is always like a home to me. Um, so Starfish provided opportunities for me, um, classes, you know, health classes. So I was working with this group of students um, in health. So I do recite to them some of the basic uh, common diseases that are in the Gambia, like hypertension, maternal mortality, female reproductive system. So as I was teaching them, um, I was falling in love with um, health, you know, knowing about people's condition. And through that, you know, um, I still, because I graduated and then I was sitting for two years, I was not going to school because I really wanted, um, I was not happy with my grades. Um, so I was sent to figure out ways, but also um, I did arts and most of in UTD, if you don't do science, then you cannot go to UTD to study nursing. Um, so I was doing that, I was able to, that was actually gave me an opportunity. Um, we had one of the uh, partners that came in the Gambia, um, we had interviews. So from the interview, I was one of the people that made it through um, to be part of the people that had the opportunity um, to have to get a scholarship to further their education. So I had that scholarship um, to go further my studies. And then um, finally, um, I got to school. And I think one of my achievements also um, is the fact that um, being through the program, um, I made it through with regards to you know, knowing myself better and um, being a mentor, but also making uh, being among the people at Starfish um, who are part of operations team. Because I came in as a mentee, you know, mentors and mentor in training, going through training, but being able to make it through, um, being a health coordinator and being an operation manager um, and also going to school. Yes. Well, well done, Awa. Um, so yes, that's basically what the two of us have. And I'm going to invite Auntie Asin to um, share a little bit about, you know, the amount of girls we've worked with and perhaps maybe some of the obstacles we faced in the way and some that um, we've lost early marriage. Um, and then we can hopefully continue from there with time. Well, um, <laughs> this is the blessing of my life after 10 years of working on the program. Uh, they can say everything that needs to be said because they are on their program. Uh, so thank you, Fatwa, for letting me say something. <laughs> um, so this is very personal to me. I said uh, earlier that I actually came back to my village to, to run a girls education program. And it's a goal that I had from when I was eight years old. My mom was one of um, the girls in this community that went into early marriage for exactly what I was said. She was the first girl in her village to go to high school, but when she finished high school and wanted to go to college, her parents said, no, you can't go because you are a girl. And so, and so you need to get married. So she got married and then had me and my brothers. And that was such a painful experience that she vowed that all her children would go to college. Um, and so for me, going to college was just something my mom said was going to happen, and by God, it was going to happen. But as I went through school here, every grade that I went to, there were fewer girls in my class. So by the time I got to high school, my uh, last year in high school, in the school that I went to school, there were a thousand boys and 60 girls. And so, that means that everybody that I grew up with around here had gotten married and had kids. They also had been circumcised because 99% of the girls in the village that I live in go through female circumcision. And when I was eight, my parents got divorced because my mom went against my dad's family and decided that I was not going to go through female circumcision and um, she was going to stand up for me. So the night that my mom left the marriage, she left with just the clothes on her back. And as she was holding my hand walking down the street, I remember thinking or vowing to myself that when I grew up, I'd do something to make sure no girl felt as helpless as I felt and no woman felt as scared as my mom must have felt at that time. But I also watched my mom pick herself up from just leaving with the clothes on her back 
And in using just her high school education, she was able to get an apartment, get a job, regain custody of her kids and send us all um, to college. So I knew that it was not just um, an idea. I don't want to go into early marriage. We had to equip the girls with the same blueprint that my mom had followed. They had to have an education, they had to have a voice, but they also had to be financially strong enough to have a voice within the family. I think the only thing that I added to that blueprint was this idea that the girls had to be completely entrenched into the culture and give people no excuse to ostracize them. So very early on from when they are 10 years old, 30, 12 years old, 13 years old, they had to be invaluable members of the society or whatever community they were in. And there could be no argument about that. So if you're a young girl in your community and every month you do a service project about an issue that is ailing the community, the community recognizes you as indispensable. So when you stand up for yourself and you say, I don't want to go into early marriage, they listen because they have benefited from your service and because they have heard your voice all along in ways that benefited them. So it wasn't just small businesses, it was also service projects that solved the problems of the communities that these girls lived in and that they didn't wait for somebody else to tell those stories. They could tell those stories themselves through photography, videography, through writing, through doing plays um, and, and skits uh, that engage the community and doing community projects and programs as well. In essence, that was it. I remember that when, I, um, when the, the earthquake in Haiti happened, I was in the US and I remember thinking, everybody wanted to help in Haiti, but they couldn't enter. And I thought if this happened in my community and people could not enter to come in and help, are there people, young people that are equipped within the community that have had years of practice so that even experts outside could and then they could implement. And that's really what girls, when um, COVID hit, we were ready because these girls had been working and taking leadership within the community for so long that immediately COVID hit, they learned what they needed to learn, the information. They translated it into their local languages. They went back into those local communities, engaged the community leaders, and then rolled out things like hand washing stations in every home, um, giving information, going to the Ministry of Education and helping the Ministry of Education um, to do those um, sensitizations that needed to be done as well. So in essence, that is all I have to say is that over time, instead of waiting until an emergency happened, we looked at the girls, mapped out the community, help the girls become leaders, um, servant leaders within their communities and voices that people had to pay attention to. So that when there was an emergency, it was just a natural follow through um, for them to be listened to and for them to be able to help. But at the same time, that even without an emergency that was outside of themselves, they had the courtesy and the cultural understanding to be able to work within the community and advocate for themselves and for girls like them. So over the um, years, we've had about a thousand girls graduate from the program. And I think we've only lost four of them to early marriage. And those four are very personal to me, but, <laughs> but we knew that even as they went into early marriage, they already had small business skills. They already knew how to dream for themselves and their children and that they didn't go helplessly into it. All right, that's all I have to say for now. <laughs> thank you. All right, Yasin. thank you, Yasin. Um, so I think at this point, we're just going to invite people. Do you have any questions, um, any points you want us to clarify? Um, yes, and then Antibahi, if you have more time, I could um, also present the slideshow as well. Wow, thank you so much. What a beautiful, just everything, presentation and approach and 
It's actually, it's so remarkable. So I personally, if I can be any sort of volunteer, let me know. It was really fascinating in the materials that you shared with me prior to today that it said that how many people have gone through this. And, and just from hearing your approach and your story, I didn't realize how kind of well-rounded or kind of what a, what a very interesting approach you take. Um, so really anything I can do, um, <laughs> no. But yeah, thank you so much. So if anyone has questions, I know some, if people also, um, we'll have the recording available. So, so, okay. so, but everyone is welcome to ask questions. I have a question. Thank you very much. That was incredibly interesting. Um, I have a, a sort of detailed question. You mentioned that you got the curriculum from the government offices uh, and were able to keep girls on track, which is so incredibly important during this sort of lockdown um, or, or social isolation period. I'm just wondering how, how you did that, if you had outdoor classes or did it on, you know, over WhatsApp or, or how you did that. Um, right, yeah. Talk to that. Yeah, so what we actually did, um, like I said, was contact the ministry and they know us, they know we've been here working with girls. And so um, when we got the syllabus, what we did was um, for each subject, we have about right now 20 mentors, 95% um, of whom have been through the program and um, were also in school, just like the students we were teaching. And so what we did was um, look at what the ministry provided us and kind of like um, designed lessons according to what we know would work with our students and study tips and where they come from. And uh, we launched the lessons through WhatsApp. So we would use, you know, um, text messages, um, videos, audios. Um, we are sending links as well. And at the end of every week, we were doing evaluations as well to see how well the students were grasped in the concepts and to better be able to design for next week. So basically that's how we planned the lessons and um, we were able to roll it out smoothly. And we were also given um, tests as well to serve as assessments to see where the students were with their lessons. Yeah, I hope that answered your question. It, it did. Um, so do most girls have access then to a phone that they can use for this kind of um, sort of text messaging and, and support? Right, so we had about 60% of our student population that had access to smartphones. Um, some of them didn't own their phone, the phones, but were able to use like their siblings' phones during class lessons or their parents' phones. Because what we did from the very beginning was also engage the parents because we know at the end of the day that was going to be important. So some of their parents, you know, know that, uh, knew that every day from Monday to Friday, the children were going to have classes at Stafford International. And so for two or three hours, they're going to be on the phone using WhatsApp for the classes. So about 60% of our students um, had access um, to the lessons we were providing on WhatsApp. So one of the things that we did, you know, when COVID hit, we didn't have information about how long it will last and all of those things. What we knew though, for sure, because they had all gone through this program, was that the girls would be the most vulnerable. But because we don't approach ever anything from a deficit perspective, we always look at a, an abundance perspective. We said, okay, the girls would be the most vulnerable, but they could also be the most powerful. And so what kinds of things can we do now to ready them so that they can actually be the most powerful? Because we knew that when it came to nutrition for the family, the girl would be the one that would be cooking all the meals. So for preventative health or for health issues where people could not get medicine or anything like that, nutrition was something we could look at. And because we had had classes continuously over the years on nutrition and traditional foods and basic foods and how they could inform the health of the, um, of the family, uh, we knew this was something we could concentrate on. We also knew that the girls would be the most vulnerable because they would be the ones that would be sent to the market. If anybody had to leave the home, it would be the girl. So how could we get her ready? And then the third one was that um, 
as far as sexual abuse and things like that, the girl would be most at risk because she was at home the most. She had to sweep uncle's um, rooms and things like that. And so we engaged the parents on, okay, this girl, we, we mapped out, um, we have chapters across the country. So we looked at the whole country and looked at which girls were furthest from us, who could physically not get to us. And those people definitely needed a phone. So we had to look at who had a phone in their family and then engage that parent as an organization and say, can you let this girl use your phone for this amount of time? And here is why. And then we also looked at which girls and which mentors were in the neighborhoods. So if you needed help or something happened, how could you reach one of us? So we did a phone tree kind of thing to say, okay, you might not have a phone, but five streets down, there's somebody there that is connected to Starfish who has a phone. So if something happens to you, make sure you reach them. They will reach somebody else who will be able to reach us. And so that's where the phones came in. So when it was time for the lessons, we had already had conversations with family members who had access to phones, who had also signed on to support these girls, which is part of our practice anyway. Every girl that we accept, there has to be a family representative that is not only connected to the program, but comes and actually offers service to the program so they can be a prime example for the girl. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And Tibahe, how are we doing with time? <laughs> well, I'd love for you to just go keep, keep sharing. <laughs> Um, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, I'm sure everyone would be delighted. I don't know how other people's time is, but maybe do you want to do like one more question or five more minutes or sure. it's very flexible. So and if people have to go, they can just log off. I, I do have a question. Um, I want to say thank you, first of all, for, for sharing your stories. And I can tell the storytelling has become such an important part of your organization just from, from what we heard today. And so I'm really appreciative of being able to learn from that. Um, I would like to know a little bit more about how... Um, your experience has been in implementing this within the community because you've talked about some of the responses of your immediate family members. So I'm wondering like with local authorities, community leaders and other um, people within the community that are influencing the lives of these young girls and also young women, how they responded to your efforts and, and how do you work with them? I just talk. <laughs> You go. Um, so uh, it's very interesting when you mentioned that. Um, so actually we have uh, partners, partnership with uh, community leaders. So like Lamen, where we are right now, we have partnership with the BDC. So it's like a community um, head leaders in Lamen. Um, so usually it's very hard. People would criticize you, say um, a lot of things, but we are glad that, you know, everything thing we are doing uh, most of the time, you know, we do go out and um, talk to these people. So when we have stuff, um, events or activities, we always reach out to them. And when, um, we are glad that we, they actually have an event and also invited us. Um, but um, most of these leaders actually play a very um, vital role in the community because most of the time, you know, when um, things happen, there are people that, when, let's say when we have volunteers, um, usually during our feast, we go to them and we want them to go experience um, uh, Tobaski or Kolete. So when we need them, we go to them and talk to them um, about, um, let's say, using the mask because most of the time uh, people, you know, are not very encouraging in terms of um, when working with us. But knowing that we have them um, that are always supporting us, um, it also helps us when we need them or when the people are, when they see what they're doing. Because most of the time, their children actually are in starfish. So when they see how they're performing and what they're doing, um, that motivates them and they see the value of the program. So usually when we have community, let's say, activities like mobile health clinic, when we go out there, actually one of the people that will always run come because they know they can benefit from it. 
Um, so we actually volunteered in Munaf during COVID. Um, we had a community development from a community team. They wanted to do mass delivery, um, and they knew that status we were already doing. Um, uh, we're already working towards COVID with regards to mass delivery, or they saw our videos on Facebook. So they actually um, invited us. So we went there. Um, we joined the team. Um, we helped them with regards to the mass delivery. And I was very grateful that Stavis was among the people that were very active with regards to talking to people about health program, you know, how they can prevent themselves. We went with our media team, we went with the whole team that were right there, very active. We were on time um, and we were working with them the whole day. Um, and that was very, um, uh, they valued that a lot. So we had one of them, um, Mr. Gabi, so we always talk about, you know, how they are thankful to have staffs in the community because they see the work and they value what staff is just doing for the community. Um, and that alone motivates the others you know, to also um, join the program and to always bring their children to staff. So we, we, we have an MOU um, with, our, our approach is three, three pronged, um, agriculture, education, and health. We feel like education for these girls cannot happen as effectively without health and agriculture being paid attention to. So we have a memorandum of understanding with the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Agriculture, and the Ministry of Education. So at the, at the policy level, um, that's where we are. And we've, we've worked with these uh, for a long time. When it comes to health, um, over the 10 years, we have graduated at least four three or four girls that have gone on to medical school and are now doctors. And so when we go out into the community, we will bring a, a group of young people who live in the village who can do things. So a 13 year old, if you needed your blood pressure checked or your blood sugar checked, instead of traveling to the city to get this done and to pay something, you can come to the Staffish Library or one of our 13 year old girls can check this or do this for you. And so when we have a clinic and we bring in the female doctors and they're all being supported by these young 13 and 14 year olds who can just do your triage and get you to the doctor that you need. It becomes an obvious example of what is possible when girls are given a chance. So a lot of the times we don't have to argue or defend or anything like that. We put the girls at work right in front of them we put boys who are supporting these girls in their work right in front of them. And they can not only see it at a distance, but they can directly benefit from it. And that, that, that really becomes um, what speaks for us more than us having to speak for ourselves. So with COVID, for example, because we have a photography and videography program, when the Ministry of Education needed videographers and photographers, um, somebody went from Starfish to go and help them with that. So instead of going to the ministry and saying, we need your help, we actually went and helped them. When it came to the local languages, we translated the COVID information in the local languages and these kids went into the communities and also posted it on Facebook. And the, these videos that we made for ourselves were available for community members and organizations to use. So basically that's it. We, we look at um, what does the community need and how can we position ourselves there so that no matter what your ideology was, if you need your blood pressure tested or your blood sugar tested, you need that done right away. And hopefully you wouldn't care whether it was a boy or a girl. And you would especially be, be grateful that your daughter could become one of those girls one day. And that's the approach we use. That's incredibly insightful. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other question? I see Fatwa is doing something with the computer. But if you can still hear us, if you have any, any other question, we'd be happy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I also want to share links. Um, so if people want to go to our Facebook page, um, I'm also sharing a presentation to learn more about staff, which that would be available. 
Thank you, thank you. That would be wonderful. Thank you so much again. Mm -hmm. Everything was amazing. So I think, think you also have a PowerPoint. In case anyone needs to go, we totally understand. We're so happy that you could have joined. But um, for those who can stay, it's just a few slides, right? Three or four or just a, a handful. So, yeah. um, so if you'd like, go ahead um, with that or whatever you prefer. Yes. Really, whatever you yeah, no, I, I can go ahead with that. I just need some help um, sharing the screen. Sure, I think I can do this one if you like. Or go ahead. <laughs> we'll try from here as well. So let's see who gets to do it first. <laughs> Where is it? I just downloaded it. Okay, we're pulling it up. <laughs> hey, by the way, for anyone who's here right now, would anyone like to present next week or in two weeks? I'm sorry. We can even have a couple people for shorter or for the full amount. Please, Savita, would you like to, by any chance, Savita? No pressure. You can also email me um, afterwards. And Starfish friends, you're welcome to join this group. Um, we can send you the link or um, or we'll be in touch by email. Thank you. <laughs> Please go ahead. Thought I'd use that. All right. Um, the slide is here, so we can start it here. Right? All right. Um, can everyone see the first slide? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So it's just about um, five slides on really the work we do and how um, people can connect. Um, as I said, I work in the area of development. And so one of the things um, I've been doing is really trying to see how the, expand, um, the organization can continue to consolidate and expand. Um, and so, you know, for our um, the work we do, it's basically, when you look at it, um, can be narrowed down to three areas. And, um, you know, that is basically looking at working with girls and providing them a well-rounded education. So if you're interested in education and investing in girls and um, looking at how to promote gender equity and equality, um, I feel like Starfish would be a perfect fit for you. Uh, we also have a very active library program that serves up to about 80 people every day, not just our students, but also community kids around. So um, that has also been existing for 10 years now. And, um, and the education that we provide as well, it is very holistic, it is very broad. We just don't look at, okay, teaching the girls to be able to speak English and speak in public, but we also look at other areas of their lives, such as um, how they can become artists, how they can um, be involved in music and dance, how they can do sports, science, especially in male dominated areas where they are usually not encouraged to venture into. And in doing all this, we also, um, you know, these activities, these clubs that we established in Starfish help them to be able to advocate for themselves. And uh, we also look at another area because we work with girls that are um, basically in school right now, middle and high school. But also um, we 
for the past two years have been looking at how to also include girls that have dropped along the way or who haven't had the opportunity to have an education. So we have a skill center program that has been running for two years now that offers um, technical and vocational training. And we have about 60 students that are in the program and are learning hairdressing, sewing, arts and craft, tie dyeing, um, you name it. And we really hope to expand that program as well. Um, you know, this way the girls going to school would be catered for and the girls um, who haven't had the chance to have a formal education would also have something to, you know, do so they can become productive members of our society. Uh, when it comes to the area of health, we focus on reproductive health and reproductive rights of girls because we know that um, this is very important in their growth. Um, and the way we approach the health education is looking at also how to do um, how to basically create awareness on preventive health. Because I, I believe it's one thing to be like, okay, this is how we can tackle the problems, but it's also smart to look at how we can avoid the problems. And so in doing that, we explore things like, what do we have in our communities that um, can boost our health systems and um, be able to give us better health? And in doing that, Stasis has actually expanded from the peer health classes that it usually have on the library campus to actually um, having community clinics. So we go to different communities and we have support from volunteers all around the world. We have our mentors um, and our girls and they go and set up a clinic and the patients come basically. Even though we're able to provide um, some sort of medication, they're also able to you know, talk to the patients and talk to them about you know, what food they should eat that are not really expensive, but around the surrounding, they just have to make use of it, how you can take care of your health, how you can um, practice better hygiene, things like that. Um, and when it comes to agriculture, we have our established land, which is really a big accomplishment for us. And uh, we actually acquired that last year and it's really towards our dream or our vision of establishing um, an art academy. This would be geared towards, you know, just enrolling girls to go to school from preschool to graduate school. And so we actually, it's about six hectares. It's about seven minutes drive from the staff's campus. And uh, we've already started investing in it, looking at projects to do, um, how we can encourage sustainable development and the use of solar. And as we do all of this, it's all led by girls, you know, doing their things and moving mountains in their communities. Um, secondly, I also know that um, there are a lot of organizations that are out there um, doing the work we do and doing community development. But for me personally, when I came into Starfish, one of the things that made me stay um, was that the organization really saw me as a human being that wasn't just um, someone's story they could tell so that they can get awards or um, get a lot of things in return. Really, they were invested in me to be able to have a brighter future. And so we have established our media house at Starfish um, in which we have males there, but we also have females that are being professional photographers and are going into the communities with their cameras. And sometimes people are looking at them like, okay, you are using that camera as a toy, but you don't really know how to use it. But when they take the pictures and they're able to show the community members what they can do, it kind of changes their mindset. And so the work we do is not just on um, sharing stories, but pushing the girls out there so they can show the community what they can do. Um, we've also been looking at partnerships, so we are not just focused on the girls, but we try to inculcate the males as well, because we know we cannot do this work alone. We work with volunteers all around the world. So if you are thinking about coming to a place or going to a place to serve, I feel Starfish is the place for you and uh, you'll be very welcome to come here. I know COVID is a bit of a restriction, but you can write to me or contact me or contact Antiba here. You'll be very welcome. We can look at ways that you can even start while you are there before you even come to us. Um, yeah, and then community members and parents, you've talked about that as well. And then sustainability, um, you know, one reason why I'm talking here and um, let's say Auntie Hassan is not um, doing development by all herself, is because really she believes that this is our program and we should own it. And so from the finance to the public relations, to the development, to the media, it's all being led by young people who have been raised in the program and are owning um, Starfish International. Um, so, you know, these are other ways that you can work with us and you can invest in the program. 
And uh, I will I will share this slide as well. So if you want to do something, you can reach out um, and be able to, you know, do something with us, which we'll be very happy about. Um, and as well, we hope to give back to you. It is not just you giving back to Starfish, but we will be able to partner so you can also get something in return. Um, these are media pages that um, you can basically also access to learn more about Starfish, especially our website, our YouTube page, and our Facebook are really, really active um, places where you can almost every week get something about what we are doing. Um, and lastly, we have um, links here as well that I can also share um, and you can just learn about the things we do. If you look at it, we have our 10 year anniversary celebration, um, how we joined the world in, you know, um, combating issues of issues affecting our communities, advocacy and abuse um, of women and girls and community service and um, a video we prepared for African Liberation Day because at the end of the day, our homeland is um, very dear to us and we know that even though many of the times people see it as a land of deficit, we are really a place of abundance and so we like to bring that and show that to the girls as we shine. Um, so really that's what I have on the slides and thank you everyone for listening and for coming here and for encouraging us. Um, these are some of the moments that keep us, you know, doing what we want to do. Thank you. <laughs>